Well, brethren and sisters, we're coming to the seventh vision, although we're not going to deal at length with that tonight, because I want to do a bit of an introduction to that if I can. But you remember that the first five visions were all about encouraging Zechariah and Zerubbabel and so forth and Haggai, the people, to involve themselves in the work of the truth. Yahweh had it all covered. He showed them in the various visions that Jerusalem had a ring of fire about it. There were four horsemen down there watching over them. They had no worries. And though those things were invisible to human eyes, brothers and sisters, Zechariah saw them vividly portrayed in those visions and he proclaimed that to the people. So those first five visions were very encouraging over the protective way in which Yahweh was looking after his people. Now remember what I said, chapter 5? I turned. Oh, there's something different coming. And then he sees this horrible vision of, first of all, a woman in this ephah, the ephah being a measure, of course, the largest measure in common use. And there was the measure of Israel's iniquity, later on developing into the two women of Samaria and Judea. We saw them sprout wings like the unclean stork and carry that measure of their filthiness over there into the region of Babylon. And there was a marvellous prophecy, and absolutely one of the most, I believe, scintillating prophecies of the Old Testament because it is so easily transferred that into the New Testament and to see the reality of that in our day. And here we are today, brothers and sisters, seeing Babylon the Great about to go to court <coughs> and some of the most hideous crimes about to be unfolded in this country of which that system has been up to. Hideous things, hideous, absolutely. And all the lies and the cheats, we understand why that scroll is written on both sides. There are not two arguments, two sides of those arguments, brothers and sisters. Though, of course, we've already had the other side putting up a very weak argument about trying to get out of this, this, the very great crisis that they've got themselves into. But it'll come to nothing. And the population in this country, at least, are going to get some rude shocks, brothers and sisters, about Babylon the Great, how really rotten that system is. It is rotten, not from the bottom to the top, from the top to the bottom, because it all starts up there. And that's what Zachariah saw fly out of Israel, a woman with a measure of iniquity to plant that in its own base. Babylon, of course, of the ancient empire, prefiguring Babylon the Great. That's what it was all about. But tonight we're going to talk about chariots. And we're going to see these four chariots. We're not going to, as I deal with length tonight with the vision itself. We're just going to touch upon it. We're going to see these four chariots coming out between those two mountains of brass, which we'll deal with next time, the, the significance of those things. But I want you to notice, brothers and sisters, that the result of that work, the largest vision ends with this comment in verse 8, Then cried he upon me, and spake unto me, saying, Behold, these that go towards the north country have quieted my spirit in the north country. So whatever they're about, it's going to put the spirit of Yahweh to rest. Yahweh's going to say, Enough is enough. So this vision is a vision of how he's going to deal with that apostasy and all other apostasies with it. And his spirit will be quieted down. And it's going to all be finished, it, brothers and sisters, when he deals with the north country. Isn't that interesting? And that's the last one he'll deal with, isn't it? The north country. And then Yahweh's spirit will quieten down, which in chapter 1, his spirit was greatly agitated because of the, of the way the Gentiles had persecuted his people and laughed them to scorn. His spirit was stirred up in chapter 1. Well, it's quiet in chapter 6. Because the seventh vision is about the time when Yahweh will send forth his armies in judgment against this world. Now, there were four chariots, but before we get into that, I want to say, show you something. I want to show you how these visions are related. You see, there's the fifth vision, and there's the seventh vision. And the two visions relate to the same agents. You watch. First of all, this one. And I turned and lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, there came four chariots out from between the two mountains, and the mountains were mountains of brass. First chariot, red horses. The second chariot, black horses. The third chariot, white horses. The fourth chariot, grizzled and bay horses. Then I answered and said unto the angel that talked with me, What are these, my lord? The angel answered and said unto me, These, now look at this in a different colour, these are the four spirits of the heavens, which go forth from standing before the Lord of all the earth. That's the seventh vision. 
brother. Here's, here's the fifth. This is what the fifth vision says about the golden lampstand and the branches feeding olive oil into the, into, the, into the lamp. And I answered again and said unto him, What be these olive branches which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? And he answered me and said, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then he said, These are the two anointed ones that stand before the Lord of all the earth. That's very, that's almost identical language, isn't it? Is that the difference? That these, this represents the ecclesia which stood before the Lord of all the earth, but those chariots represent the same ecclesia going forth from before the Lord of all the earth. See the point? Here's the establishment of Yahweh's ecclesia. And they're the ones that stand before the Adon, the ruler of the whole earth. They stand there, and we do today. But the day is coming we're going to be in those chariots, brothers and sisters. Not literally, of course, but the, the chariots of the cherubim, we will ride them through this world. We will not be standing in, the, in, the, in, in his presence. In that sense, we will be sent forth on a mission. So you see how they're related by that, that comment. Now you take these two visions. Take the first vision of the four horsemen and relate that to the seventh vision. Again, you'll see it relates to the same agents. This one says, Then I said, O oh my Lord, what are these? And the angel that talked with me said unto me, I will show thee what these be. And the man that stood among the myrtle trees answered and said, These are they whom Yahweh has sent to walk to and fro through the earth. So he sent them to walk to and fro. What are these chariots? And the bay went forth and sought to go that they might walk to and fro through the earth. And he said, get you hence, walk to and fro through the earth. So they walked to and fro through the earth. It's exactly the same thing. So those who were watching over Israel's fortunes, who prayed for the peace of Jerusalem, who saw God's purpose with his people, were protected by the divine horsemen in the shadow of the Almighty. They are going to be sent to walk through the earth and there they go in those chariots. So you see how they're related. Just that language just shows he's talking about the same people. So whether it's the, 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 the first or the seventh vision, including the, 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 uh, the sixth one about that woman, it doesn't matter which vision you look at, it's talking about, brothers and sisters, the fortunes of the ecclesia. That's what it's talking about. God's work in the earth, here in Zechariah's day, in the, in the, with the angelic visitation, working through the angels... And we're going to be doing all this in the very near future in the next world. Because Zechariah is a springboard, of course, to the apocalypse, has been well known in the Old Testament as a little apocalypse. It is the springboard to the apocalypse. And it can be all related to that language. And you see that language used there, brothers and sisters, and you know, of course, that it's talking about the ecclesia. Why four? Well, you see... The symbolism of the number four, now it's used in several places. Basically, it's about that. Almost everywhere you read about that four, that the number four, it's, it's based upon the four square encampment. Israel was set out in their tribes, three on every side of the, of the compass, and there was four square camp. And we're going to see, brothers and sisters, that become the basis of the symbolism of the four. So we find that when, when Israel were left Mount Sinai, they came down from Egypt as a straggling mass of humanity in ranks of five, but they didn't go out of Sinai like that. After 11 months of very, very great organisation, they went out in a blaze of glory, brothers and sisters, and the tribes now all set out in order with the, with the ark marching in the middle of them and the trumpet blasting and the cloud moving off and Moses' prayer ringing in the ears of the people, rise up, Yahweh, and let thy enemies be scattered. And as the blast of the trumpet, the singing of the priest, and away they went out of Sinai, all based upon the four square encampment of this vision and the other visions, brothers and sisters. And we're going to see a very significant difference that we, when we go marching, brothers and sisters, we'll march different than they did because of the significance of that. There were four faces of the cherubim. We'll see, and I'm going to devote probably the rest of tonight 
speaking about that, the, not so much the faces, but the cherubim itself, and I'll tell you why in a minute. There were four horsemen. Uh, there were four carpenters. There were four chariots. And in the apocalypse, there were four living creatures. Out the four square encampment of Israel. Whether it's the cherubim, the horses, the carpenters, the chariots, or the living creatures, it's an extension of that, of that symbolism. It's the hope of Israel, brothers and sisters. That's what it's all about. Now, because we're going to get onto chariots, chariots in the scripture are linked with the cherubim. So what I want to do tonight, brothers and sisters, and I'm going to do this deliberately for perhaps newly baptised members of our meeting and perhaps for some of our young people who may not have ever done an in-depth study of the cherubim, and tonight won't be an in-depth study, but what I want to show you Quite apart from going in depth in it, in all the detail, what it really means, what is the symbolism of the cherubim? What is it all about in simplicity? I want to show you what it is. Because the, 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 the chariots and the cherubim are linked together. Now the proof of that, and I want you to turn this reference up with me, is in the First Chronicles chapter 28. And this was not the only proof of it. So let's have a look at this one. In the first of Chronicles chapter 28, we come to verse 18, and it says, David was talking about, of course, the pattern of the temple that Solomon, uh, Solomon was going to build, and, and the, all the things that were David's gift concerning that tabernacle or that temple. And in verse 18 of 1 Chronicles 28, it says, And for the altar of incense, refined gold by weight, gold for the pattern of the chariot of the cherubim. The chariot of the cherubim. Now, you notice we never say cherubims with the S on the end, because cherubim is the plural. It is the plural. If we're going to talk about a singular cherub, well, that's singular, cherub, but cherubim is the plural. That's why we never say cherubims, because cherubim is the plural of the word. And they spread out their wings that cover the Ark of the Covenant of Yahweh. And this design that David is, uh, that is being talked about here, that David contributed all this gold and silver to, brothers and sisters, was a design given by God to David. David was the, was the designer, the architect of Solomon's temple. And in the first Chronicles 29, which is of chapter over, he made that claim of the pattern of the spirit which he had from Yahweh. David. Now, bear in mind, David drew all the necessary details with Solomon's temple. It's called Solomon's temple. It really was David's temple. But really, of course, it's Yahweh's temple. But David was the one that Solomon had to get the plan out and he had to follow that specifically. And when they brought the cherubim in, brothers and sisters, the ark with the cherubim with their wings over the top, two of them on either side touching over the top of the mercy seat, David, according to the spirit of Yahweh, had been told to build two massive olive wood cherubim that went right up above them and their wings came across and touched in the middle and their wings stretched out and they touched either side of that house. So right underneath them was a, a very diminutive cherubim down there between their feet, as almost between them, and their two wings, or four, four wings, stretching across, stretched the whole width of that temple. In other words, whatever else, whatever else was important, when it comes to real importance, it's the, it's the most holy place it narrows down to the mercy seat. It narrows down to those who look at the mercy seat, but now they're stretching out here right across the world. And the cherubim would have dominated those two massive polished olive wood cherubim, exquisitely, of course, sculptured brothers and sisters to make a magnificent view of it. And there they were stretching across Solomon's temple called the chariot of the cherubim. And that's why I thought at this stage... It might be as well, therefore, to have a look at the significance of that, the significance of what is meant by the chariot of the cherubim. Look at this. 
we read that Yahweh sits enthroned and rides the cherubim on the wings of the Spirit. So we read, Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, thou that leadest Joseph like a flock, who art enthroned upon the cherubim. Shine forth, says the RSV version. So Yahweh is not only between the cherubim, he's enthroned upon them. He's enthroned upon them. They make a throne for him. And he's enthroned upon those cherubim. How significant is that? Yahweh reigns, let the people tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim. Let the earth quake! Because you see, brothers and sisters, when there's chariots we've been looking at, go forth and send forth. Yahweh is in those chariots, in the people that are driving them. They are the cherubim. It's the people that are the cherubim. But the symbolism is showing the work they've got to do and the type of work they've got to do, and they're not doing it on their own behalf, and they're not going forward without their king. He rides with them. And he rode upon the cherub and did fly. Yea, he did fly upon the wings of the wind. And when you go to that psalm, which we won't do now, brothers and sisters, it, it, it's a psalm of David when he was in desperation, when all his enemies were, were, were filed up against him and things looked gloomy and dark for David. The days of Ahithophel, Absalom and all those days were culminating in this dreadful thing that was coming upon him and he felt absolutely helpless. And he saw himself, brothers and sisters, being chased by his enemies hurling great thunderbolts at him and doing everything to stop him and to kill him. And he found himself tumbling over in a stream and almost drowning. And he, Yahweh reaches down and drags him out and he puts him down. Oh, he's in a desert. There's not a soul around him. He looks around. Where are they gone? He's alone. He's free. And he says, he rides upon a carob, flies upon the wings of the wind. And he rescued David. So we know about the cherubim is about rescuing people. We know that much, don't we? And we know, of course, it's the way in which God manifests himself. It's the way he gets around the world. Elijah and Elisha were both called the chariots of Israel. Elisha, or rather Elijah, and it came to pass as they, that is Elijah and Elisha, still went on and talked, that behold there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and departed them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it and he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. That's what Zechariah You see what happened? Fifty sons of the prophets, all ambitious for the role of the leading prophet when Elijah was going. And Elijah goes from place to place. Elisha will not part from him. Elijah kept telling him, you stay here. No, I'm not. I'm coming with you. They finally get to Jericho. Now he says, you've got to stay here. I'm going to be taken away this day. Yes, but I want to come. And he wouldn't be separated. And the 50 sons of the prophets come to him and they say, hey, do you know your master's going to get taken away today? He said, hush. The Hebrew word means hush. Don't want to hear it. I know about it, he said. And they all stood afar off, the 50 of them, to see what was going on because all they were wanted to know was who's the next boss? And so when they get across the other side of Jordan, Elijah smith, smith and his mantle on the river and it parted and they walked through. Elisha makes his request. And Elijah said, you've asked a hard thing, but if you see me go, it'll be granted. And he saw him go, didn't he? We just read that, brothers and sisters. And every photograph, every picture you see of Elijah going up into heaven, he's taken up by a chariot, and it's not what that says. They're all wrong. He went up with a whirlwind. Where the chariots go? What happened to them? Well, you see, what's happened? These two men going along. This man's going to get taken out of the way. He's been the chariot of the cherubim rescuing people. His record of rescue was one, the woman of Sarephath. But nonetheless, he was a good trier. He was rescuing people. Yahweh was riding in that man for the salvation of those he wanted in the truth. Now, he's going. This man has ambitions, and they're good ambitions. 
He's prepared to give up everything to do the same work as Elijah. As Elijah. He wants it desperately. He wants to serve his God. Will it happen? What did, what did the chariots do? Parted them. So the, two, the, the chariots come racing at him. Imagine the scene. And went through the middle of them. They both went either way like that. A whirlwind comes. A big whirlwind picks up Elijah. And away he goes. And Elisha sees him. The chariots of Israel. My father, my father. The chariots of Israel and the horsemen thereof. Where did the chariots go? We're not told them. We're told later on in the Second Kings, aren't we? We're told later on. Elisha is in Dothan. The Syrians encompass the city and his servant is panic-stricken. And Elijah prays to Yahweh and he said to Yahweh, open the eyes of that young man. He's got no need to be frightened. Elisha knew that he was covered by the protection of his God. He wanted God to show this young fellow. And it says, he opened his eyes and what did he see? He saw the chariots of God around about Elisha, not the city, doesn't say around about Dothan. They were around about him. That's where they went. They didn't go anywhere. So when Elijah was, se Elijah was separated and took up in the whirlwind, the chariots come down right around Elisha. That's where they are. And now he is being ridden. Or rather, he's the rider of Yahweh's chariot. He's the chariot of the cherubim, rescuing people. All around about him. Isn't that wonderful, brothers and sisters? And when he died, now when Elisha was fallen to his sickness, whereof he died, and Joash, the king of Israel, came down unto him and wept over his face and said, what did he say? My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. That's where they were. They never left the earth. You want to know something? They still haven't. We know that, brothers and sisters. We know by what's going on in Europe. We know what's going on in Israel. We know what's going on all around the Middle East. And we know what's going on in the Catholic Church. They are still here. And they're being ridden by the angels on high, brothers and sisters. And the day's going to come when they will step out of that chariot and we will step in. That is, of course, what Paul tells us in the 12th chapter of Hebrews and in Hebrews chapter 2. For the world to come is not under the control of the angels, said Paul. It's under the controls of those who will supersede them in that position. And we will become the chariots of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And on Yahweh's behalf, brothers and sisters, we will do all in our power to bring this world back to sensibility and to decency and to the honour to the almighty God in heaven above. That's what we'll do. They haven't gone anywhere, those chariots. It's really a, a, a grand thing, brothers and sisters, that's really happening. Now, what about these cherubim then? What, what is the real issue with the cherubim? Well, if you come back, here's, here's the, you always, the first incident is always the best one. In Genesis chapter 3, and this says it all, brothers and sisters, you really, you won't ever get away from this because it won't mean any more than this. And it certainly won't mean any less. It's all about this. <coughs> Adam and Eve have sinned and they're driven out of the garden. And in the last verse of Genesis chapter 3, it's all here. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Now, there are several very significant things there. First of all, the east was always the front, whether it was the tabernacle or Solomon's temple or the temple that Nehemiah and the others, of course, and Ezra and them uh, were appointed in, or whether it was the one in, that Herod built in Jerusalem, the east was always where the front door was. <coughs> When it says in the law they had a sprinkle blood directly towards the front of the tabernacle, it was the eastern side of it. It always faced Jerusalem, and rather the Mount of Olives, which is directly east from Jerusalem. Now don't forget that. That is the east of the Garden of Eden. So where are the cherubims? They're not in Eden. They're at the front door. 
That's a significant thing in Genesis chapter 3. The other thing is, brothers and sisters, they got a flaming sword. And there's no way you're going to cool it down and get past it. It's not going to let anyone pass unless they meet the conditions. That flaming sword is going to keep everybody out unless the conditions are met for entry. That's, this is the cherubim. This is the, the root, root meaning of cherubim is here. And it turns every way. North, south, east and west. Four ways. So it's not a double-edged sword. It's got four sides to it. If anybody approaching from any point of the compass is not going to get through unless they meet the conditions. And it's not there to close the Garden of Eden, but to ensure it's always open to people who want to come in on the proper basis to keep the way, not to shut it up, not to forever lock it, but to make sure it's always an opportunity for people to get through that door, providing they can get past that sword and they've got to meet conditions to do that. It's the way back. It's the way back. The proper way back. Adam and Eve have gone out in disgrace. Now there's a way back. As it is with us, brothers and sisters. I've done and sought, thought things that I think are quite disgraceful and I'm ashamed to say it, but you've all done the same. But there's a way back. We thank God for that way. And so that's what the, the cherubim are all about. Now here's a remarkable thing. The three great visions of the cherubim, whether it was in Ezekiel's temple, Ezekiel's prophecy rather, or whether it was John on the Patmos, or whether it was in the Garden of itself, were all given to people in exile. Isn't that incredible? Adam and Eve were exiled from, from Eden. Ezekiel was in exile in Babylon. And John was exiled to the Isle of Patmos off the coast of Greece. All in exile. And the three major visions of the cherubim, God was saying, there's a way back. That's what it's all about. You, you, you can go into the cherubim. I've seen read books about it. And there's all sorts of elaborate things they say about the details and so forth. Most of them are right. I'm not talking about only what's in the truth. You hear, read a lot of nonsense in the, the outside commentaries. But even in the truth, you sometimes read a whole lot of stuff that's quite, quite good, quite excellent. But that's the meaning of the cherubim. When all said and done, it's about God having chariots in which he puts his servants for the sole purpose of showing people there is a way back. That's what it's all about. That's why those chariots are going out into the world, brothers and sisters, to tell this wicked world that it's not all over. There is a way back. But it's got to be a way that God says. Now you look at this one. To keep the way to the tree of life. Now, those same two words, and this is only just a sample, that's not the word etc there or the abbreviation etc the two words keep and way are used together in those psalms as well as a host of others and other references you can go home and test that out for yourself you'll find they're used in those contexts together to keep the way now let's have a look what the word how the word keep is used brothers and sisters it's used in the following way now remember what i said they were standing at the east of the Garden of Eden. They were at the front door. Here's how the word keep is used. Keepers of the house. This is talking about the priests and the Levites. Keepers of the door. Keepers of the gate. Got the message? The altar. But they're all at the front door. The altar, of course, was out in the outer court. Just, them, just, just straight almost behind the front door. So the first thing you learn when you come in the tabernacle concerning the word keep 
was that when you went through into the, into the, inner, into the outer court, you see the outside of course was all the camp of Israel, if you went through and, and, and of course some of the sacrifices took you through to the outer court, the first thing that confronted you was the altar. The first thing that confronts us, brothers and sisters, if we want to come back to God into the great paradise of God that is coming, the first thing we confront is the altar of Christ's sacrifice, isn't it? That's the way back. And there's a four-edged sword that says there's no way you're going to get back unless you accept the principles that man stood for and taught. That's the issue. That's the caribbean. That's it in a nutshell. All those keepers. And guess what? When you come to this one, Jesus Christ is the ultimate keeper of the way to the tree of life. To him that overcometh will I give the right the right to partake of the tree of life. There's a right about it, isn't it? And it's to him that overcometh. So the way back is God's way. And the final keeper is Jesus Christ himself because he is the door. Isn't he? He said that. I am the door. If any man comes in any other door, he's a thief and a liar. There's only one door and there's no way back unless it's through him. Now there you are, brothers and sisters, that is what is the cherubim is all about. And whatever else, the other symbol, and you go through the various symbology of it, it's all true, it'll only embellish that principle. It'll only talk about that principle. Now let's have a look at this one. Ezekiel's vision of the cherubim. Their wings were joined one to another. This is Ezekiel chapter 1. They turned not when they went. They went everyone straight forward. As for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man, the face of a lion on the right side, and they had the face of an ox on the left side. And they four also had the face of an eagle. Thus were their faces and their wings were stretched upward. Two wings of every one were joined one to another and two covered their bodies. And they went every one straight forward whither the spirit was to go, they went and they turned not when they went. Now, that's what it says. I want you to turn up to Ezekiel 1 because we're going to have a look at this one together because this is, of course, a major vision of the cherubim and it's going to tell us several other things about them. So Ezekiel had this vision. Now, it's important, brothers and sisters, to know from what direction that vision came. Now, here he is, here. This is Ezekiel, something like him, I hope. There's your compass. And he sees that vision coming out of the north parts. And it's about that four-square encampment. You see, it's about that four-square encampment. I said, that, that is the basis of the number four. And everywhere you go, that's the basis of it. And you see what it says. As for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man. Now, if it was coming out of the north, the first face you would see, of course, would be the one on the south, wouldn't you? And guess what? That's where Reuben was, which Jewish tradition says the standard was a man. We've got nowhere in the Bible that says that those four faces the man, the lion, the ox and the eagle were the standards of Israel. There's nowhere in the Bible that specifically says that, but this does. This says it in another way. It says it in a symbolic way because it gives you the directions. So the first face he saw was the face of a man. Then he saw on the right side, if he's facing north, the right side would be over here to the east. He saw a lion. And you all know about the lion of the tribe of Judah, surely. And then you find that he finds the face of an ox on his left side, and that's exactly where the Ephraim was the leading tribe over there. See, they're the four leading tribes of the twelve, of the four corners of the compass. He said, and he just simply says, and they four had the face of an eagle. So obviously that would be at the back, and that was Dan. That's exactly where Jewish tradition puts it. And so the Bible doesn't specifically say, but I believe that does say it. Very, very clearly. Now, brothers and sisters, this vision of the cherubim had some remarkable things about it. And I want you to notice, 
in verse 9, I want to just take about four points about this vision. It says, their wings would join one to another, which we have tried to portray on the, up there on that illustration. So they were wingtip to wingtip, right? That's the first thing we learn, they, that they are in formation. Now in verse 12, it says this, and they went everyone straight forward, whither the spirit was to go, they went. Okay. Then it says, in verses 13 and 14, the spirit moved with the speed of lightning. Now just pause there. I want, one other thing I want to mention a little bit later, but just pause there. So what we do, if you wanted to do this with an exercise at Sunday school to teach the children about following Jesus Christ, get, get, make yourself up a little, get some four pieces of timber and glue them together to make a pretty much a perfect square. Then put it on the table, get one of the children to hold a stick in the middle, about where they think the middle of that is, and then you start to move that thing like this and tell the child to keep the stick right in the middle. See, here you go. That's what that vision's saying. The saints are wingtip to wingtip. Unity in Christ Jesus our Lord, the four square and camp from Israel. In the centre is the captain of our salvation, who in terms, brothers and sisters, of morality, has done it with the speed of lightning. In other words, it's been perfect. Flash! And in the kingdom, wherever he goes, we will go. He will always be in the centre. And instead of marching out from Sinai, you know, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Reuben, Gad, and Asher, and so forth. Instead of that, no, no, we will go in a square. And wherever the spirit goes, we will go with it. We'll always be in the middle. Now, there are two separate entities, but something binds them together. They can't be separated. There's something there, brothers and sisters, that's telling us that the spirit of the eternal God is such that though they are two separate entities, as it were, they move in conjunction with each other perfectly. That is a wonderful symbol, an absolutely wonderful symbol. And it's not as if God will give us super energy to, to travel like lightning. And it's not as if Jesus Christ will go around the world like a flash of lightning. I'm not saying that. What it's saying is, brothers and sisters, that such is the relationship of the redeemed saints to their leader. It doesn't matter what he says, where he goes, what he does, they will have him always in the centre of their, their, their objectivity, the centre of their life. Their whole nature now is like his. We've done away with the, with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye and the pride of eye are gone, thank God. And here we are, brothers and sisters, moving in total unity with that man. That's that vision. They don't march out an Indian file. No way do they do that. Now, when you look, at those faces, there's something else you notice. Well, before we get there, the other feature I wanted to touch, tell you is in verse 24 in Ezekiel chapter 1. This is the other feature. And in verse 24 it says, And when they went, I heard the noise of their wings like the noise of great waters and the voice of the Almighty, the voice of speech. Now, we're very familiar, brothers and sisters, with the symbol of a multitude of waters. It's a symbol of a host, isn't it? We're going to come across that shortly in our talk tonight. We're going to see that again. And we're going to see it in Ezekiel. And therefore, we know that this, these cherubim represent a great, massive host of people. So, so, so massive, it's like a thundering cataract of a, of a waterfall thundering out, brothers and sisters. It's like a tide of the sea raging into the shore. It's making a tumultuous noise. And all these people keeping Christ dead centre. Doesn't matter where he goes, what he does, anything. He's the centre of their life. That's what it's all about. That's the Caribbean. And it's all for the purpose of getting people back to the truth. That's the Caribbean. It's all about that. There's no doubt about that. But the other feature, which is not, a, which you probably see a bit clearer if I put it like that, 
is that's how they would have seen it. The man always in front, the lion on the right, the ox always on the left, and the eagle all on the back. Therefore, that not only the standards of Israel were equivalent to the four points of the compass, but every one of them looked in. You've got the man, the lion, the ox, and the eagle all looking inward. So they might represent north, south, east, and west. They also represent one vision towards the centre. That's the cherubim. That's the symbol, brothers and sisters, of the saints of Almighty God. Now in Ezekiel's prophecy, he saw the cherubim of the temple go away from Jerusalem. A tragic event. <coughs> the departure of the cherubim from the temple. Then the glory of Yahweh departed from off the threshold of the house and stood over the cherubim. It doesn't say that the glory, brothers and sisters, left. It says he departed. He'd had enough. Then did the cherubim lift up their wings and the wheels beside them, and the glory of the God of Israel was over them above. And the glory of Yahweh went up from the midst of the city and stood upon the mountain, which is on the east side of the city. It's only one mountain east of Jerusalem. And that's that one, the Mount of Olives, over there. That's the way the, tent, the, the, the cherubim went. They went out Jerusalem from that direction. But the glory's coming back, brothers and sisters, by the same way. And the first prophecy we got is Ezekiel's prophecy. Afterward, he brought me to the gate, even the gate, that looked toward the east. East of Eden. And behold, the glory of the God of Israel came from the way of the east. And what was his voice like? The noise of many waters. Our noise will be part of that. Our voice will be in that verse, brothers and sisters, if we make the kingdom of God. I say it again. We will be there in that verse. Because that's talking about the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. His voice was like the voice of many waters and the earth shined with his glory. Back the way it went out. What Zechariah said. Then shall Yahweh go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, the front door. He's going to open it, brothers and sisters, and then stand there with a four-edged sword. Not literally, of course, but with the word of God. Want to come back? Here are the conditions. Before Jerusalem, which is on the east, and you know this one, but while they looked steadfastly towards heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, ye men of Galilee, why stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Then they returned unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet. So he went out that way, he'll come back that way. We know that, we've learnt that many years ago. Just think about that. I mean, that's the Bible. I mean, it's incredible to read that in Acts. I never cease to marvel at that. You run that back through Zechariah, then back to Ezekiel, then back, back to the Garden of Eden, right back, back through the law, back through the tabernacle, back through the temple. It comes right up here. And he's coming back, brothers and sisters, the same way as he went out. And then what's going to happen? Well, you see, the cherubim became known as the seraphim here. Cherubim has a very difficult derivation to know exactly what it meant. Some say it comes from a Hebrew verb, which means ride, that is in a chariot. Perhaps that's correct. But now we've got the seraphim, which means burning ones, burning ones. And here is a different view of the cherubim, isn't it? In the year that King Uzziah died, King Uzziah, who was he? Well, he was a very great king. He had two names. Uzziah, which means Yahweh had made me strong, and Azariah, which means Yahweh hath helped me. 
And it was, he was greatly helped, says one verse, till he was made strong. And when he was made strong, his heart was lifted up with pride. And he wanted to be a priest as well as a king and decided that he would take over both roles. And the reason he did that, I believe, was because the high priest in his reign was a man called Azariah. So he felt that he could bind those two officers together and no one could ever do that. It was impossible. The law had stated to be a priest, you had to be a member of one man's family, that of Aaron. He was of the tribe of Levi. He didn't belong to any other tribe, so you had to be of that lineage, that tribe. And if you wanted to be a king, way back in Genesis 49, right before the law was ever given, it says, of course, uh, that the ruler would come out of Judah. The lawgiver would come from Judah. King priests would come from two separate families, two separate tribes. So if you were a Judah, you could be a king but never a priest. If you were from Levi, you could be a priest but never a king. If you were any other tribe, you couldn't be either. And God done that deliberately because he, he knew that there was not a man alive that could ever get those two officers together to make them function perfectly together. But we're going to read in Zechariah later on that between one man, the office of king and priest, the office will be, he'll have both of them. And that man is the Lord Jesus Christ. And what made it so difficult to get him together? Why didn't they get him together? Why did God do that? Was it because he wanted two men instead of one? No, you see, because it says about a king, he that ruleth over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. It says about a priest, for every priest that is ordained for men, must have compassion on the ignorant and them that are out of the way. And just nobody got that together perfectly. There were plenty of just men who erred on the side of mercy. And there were plenty of merciful men who erred on the side of justice. There was nobody that got it together perfectly except one man, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he did it magnificently. He was merciful, brothers and sisters, the way that people have never been merciful. Some would say he was merciful to the extreme because others couldn't be as merciful as he could. But never, ever, ever was he unjust. Mercy was never offered at the sacrifice of justice. And justice was never done without the consideration of mercy. And it was done with a magnificent, perfect, perfect balance. This man thought that he could do that. In the seraphim vision, it says it, 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 he saw this high priest, this Lord, it, it, actually the throne and the priest in that verse. Here's a man that's going to do it. Above it stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. And with the other two, he flew. And Isaiah says, Yahweh hid his face from the house of Jacob. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth the gospel of peace known to Israel. They cover the feet. And the wings get lifted up. Lo, we turn to the Gentiles, said Paul, and flew around the world. That's what that vision is about. We know that because Paul quotes that, and you read it the other night in Acts 28, quoted that vision to show that that was about his work. When God said about Jacob, no longer want to see you, no longer want to know you with the gospel. I'm off. That's what that vision is about. That's the other version of the Caribbean brothers and sisters. So they, they weren't going to rescue Israel. Israel had perverted the way back. The gate was locked. No one's going to get in the eastern door while that crowd are carrying on like their so-called king priest. But we're going to do it. And before the throne, there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And around about the throne, on every side of the creatures, full of eyes, front and behind, the first living creature was like a lion, second like an ox, the third was like a man, the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle. There they are. There they are, brothers and sisters. Except this time we've got the lion in front. 
And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around about and within, and day and night they never cease to say, and here's a quotation from Isaiah 6, Holy, holy, holy is Yahweh, or God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. The Lord God Almighty. Actually, El Shaddai, really, is the title. So that's out of Isaiah 6. So Isaiah, brothers and sisters, was smitten with leprosy. He had to rend his garments, cover his beard, which was a symbol of maturity, and if anyone come near him, he'd say, I'm clean! I'm clean! And here are the cherubim flying out of Israel. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Ail Shaddai. And there we are, Revelation chapter 4. But there we have it, brothers and sisters, the cherubim of the future. And what a future that is. What a marvellous privilege. You know, I find it very difficult at times, brothers and sisters, to, because I have a vivid imagination, which perhaps has been demonstrated from this platform more than often than not, but I do have a vivid imagination and, and I try my hardest to keep it on the right track and it doesn't always stay there. But when I can get it on that track and I think about these things, you know, it frightens me. It's too great, isn't it? It's too good. And you sometimes you think, how could it ever happen? How, how could we ever breathe in immortality? Endless life. Endless life. How could we, brothers and sisters, move with the Lord Jesus Christ like keeping a square around a bolt of lightning? How can we do such things? And you get this, this enormous, almost overwhelming feeling come over you and it almost crushes you and you think, is it true? Of course it's true. And, and you bring yourself down to earth in reality and you think, well, there's Israel and the land, brothers and sisters. The signs are all about us everywhere. They're everywhere. You open up your Bible and you just see it all working together. This verse locks in here and this verse locks in there. Language which is used, which is explicit back in the Old Testament, deliberately said so that it reflects on something that landed in the world about 2,000 years later. And you think, of course it's true. But it takes a lot, brothers and sisters, to really, really get into our head the reality of what's ahead of us. And as I say, if you do, we're able to do that in measure. I don't say I can do it. I don't do it perfectly. But if you can measure do that, you, it, it, it is in overall, it, it overawes you. But when you see things like this, and you see uh, the scripture breathing like it does together, brothers and sisters, then you have confidence. And that's the Caribbean. <laughs> And I've done all that tonight, brothers and sisters, because that, I believe, is what the four chariots are all about. And God willing, we'll talk about that next class. Well, thank you, Brother John. That's a lot for us to think about this evening. A very encouraging evening and something for us all very much to look forward to, isn't it? When our Lord will be back in the earth. We'll now call forward our brother Phil, who will give us the announcements. <laughs>